unnecessary because every man is worth for what he says and he will be held accountable for what he does. So we would like the brothers and sisters to take that which is being put forth and to try to practice that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the book of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah we ask the brothers and sisters to listen attentively and to take lesson from it. Assalamu Sisters, can you hear this in the back? Indicate by showing your hands, please. Okay, that's good. Okay. All right. Now, our time is short, so let us begin. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'kiru. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله The best narrative is the book of Allah وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم The best guidance is that of our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتساتها and the worst of affairs are those things that we introduce into this deen of ours. وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every innovation leads astray. وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every going astray is in the fire. I was asked to speak on one of the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, which was reported by Abi Hurairah رضي الله عنه where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us, he said, كُلُّ أُمَّتِي يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى All of my nation, all of the Muslims, shall enter paradise, except the one who refuses. This will be the theme of the discussion tonight, insha'Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah An-Nur, the chapter of light. He says concerning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِن تُطِيعُهُ تَهْتَدُوا And if you obey him, then you shall be guided. And this is what we call a conditional clause. That you shall only be guided correctly if there is obedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in another verse of the Quran he says وَاتَّبِعُهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ and follow him in order to receive guidance this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Al-A'raf and in another verse of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us وَمَنْ يُتِعُ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَعَ اللَّهِ And whoever obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here in this particular hadith narrated by Abi Huraira, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the word ummah. Ummah, this particular expression has a number of meanings. But in this particular hadith, the ulama, when discussing it, explained to us that the word Ummah refers to two groups. Those who received the message, accepted it, and those who have not yet received it, and have to be invited or called towards Islam. They call them Ummah to Dawah. 
the one who receives it and embraces Islam, Ummatul Ijaba, the Muslims. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us in the hadith which was also reported by Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ أَوْ نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِي By him in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad. لا يسمع بي أحد من هذه الأمة يهودي ولا نصراني anyone who hears about me from among this Ummah whether he be a Jew or Christian ثم يموت ولم يؤمن بالذي أرسلت به إلا كان من أصحاب النار any one of these individuals who hears about the message of Islam and then does not believe in what I have been sent with except that he shall be of the people of the fire, the companions of hell. Now, <clears throat> this particular statement actually, as pointed out in the hadith, refers to the Jews and the Christians. But there is a share of it in respect to the Muslims as we shall see insha'Allah. Unless, of course, you're one of those individuals who shall be tested on Yawm Al-Qiyamah as come in the hadith of Al-Aswad ibn Sari' where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Arba'un yahtajjoon Yawm Al-Qiyamah Four individuals shall come and they shall have or present their proofs or their arguments on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and one individual was the person who was deaf the one who was deaf and couldn't hear and he will say my lord the message came and I couldn't hear the other one is the one who was a type of imbecile not really sound of mind and he will say my lord the message came and the children were casting were casting or stoning me with filth and the other person will be a person who is senile, very old, and not really able to comprehend what has been said to him. And this person will say, Oh Allah, the message came, and I really wasn't able to understand. And a person who died without really receiving the message. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall take upon these people a pledge that they shall obey him and he will tell them go into the fire now you see some of these people will go and they will look at the fire and they will see the torment of the flames and what is going on there and they will disobey and not enter it go back to Allah and say you know uh, oh Allah you know we, we came we, we, we ran from the fire and so we really can't do it the Prophet ﷺ said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِي By him in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, if they had only entered it, it would have become cool for them and a source of security. But because they refuse, they would have refused in this dunya as well, and they will be dragged therein. These people are the ones who will have something that to say on Yom al -Qiyamah and have something to present as an excuse. As for those who received the message, heard the teachings of Islam correctly, for them it is a different case. These people will be punished for rejecting the teachings of Islam, whether they be Jew or Christian. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in his book وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Whoever desires a deen other than Islam, it shall never be accepted from him and on the life, in the life to come, he shall be of the losers. Now that concerns that relates to everybody, whether you be a Christian or Jew, and I'm pointing this out because unfortunately in this day and time there is a statement that the Jews and Christians will be rubbing shoulders 
with the Muslims in paradise, whether they hear about the teachings of Islam or not. That they will be there in paradise with those obedient Muslims. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall bless with paradise and they'll be going in together. I want you to listen to something that occurred during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik, he said, there was a Jew, sorry, a Christian, who had embraced Islam. وَقَرَأَ الْبَقَرَ وَآلِ Imran, And he had recited Surah Tul Baqarah and Ali Imran. Studied it. And he used to write revelation for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَعَادَ نَسُرَانِيًا And he returned to Christianity. And he used to say, مَا يَدْرِ مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا مَا كَتَبْتُ لَهِ He used to say, Muhammad knows nothing except what I write for him. Knows nothing except what I write for him. فَأَمَاتَهُ Allah, And Allah caused him to die. And the people buried him. And the following day they found that the earth spat him out. Would not accept him and they found him on top of the earth. They said, هَذَا فِعْلُ مُحَمَّدٍ وَأَصْحَابِ This is from Muhammad and his companions. When our, when our man ran away from them, they did this to him. Dug his grave up. So they buried him and made the grave a little bit deeper. And they got up the following morning and the earth would not accept his body. Found it on top again. And they said, no, this is the act of Muhammad and his companions. When our companion fled from him, they dug his grave up again and threw him outside of the grave. And so they decided that we will dig the grave deeper. And so they did this. And the other day, they found that the earth spat him out. Don't want you down here. And they got up the following morning and they saw it. They said, now nah, this is not an act of the people. This is another source. And so they left him there. This was a person who had embraced Islam, was once a Christian, and went back to Christianity, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treated him. To show the people this sign and the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was a disgrace for that individual. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for those who were in doubt. Anas ibn Malik said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a young boy that used to attend him, a Jewish boy. And he became ill. And the Prophet ﷺ went to visit him. And he sat down by his head and he said to him, Aslim, become a Muslim. Embrace Islam. فَنَذُرَ إِلَىٰ أَبِيهِ And he looked at his father, who was sitting next to him. And his father says, Ati Abu Qasim, obey the father of Qasim, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And so he embraced Islam and the Prophet وسلم, as he was leaving he says Alhamdulillah alladhi anqadahu min nar All praise is due to Allah who saved him from the fire. A Jew. Yet we have people with the audacity to say Is it right for you to be a Jew or a Christian? You don't have to embrace Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Those who believe, the Jews and the Christians, whoever work righteous deeds, who believe in Allah on the last day and work righteous deeds, they shall have their reward with Allah. And no fear is on them, and nor shall they grieve. This particular verse is as truthful as every other verse in the Qur'an, but we need to understand. We need to understand, was this for a particular time period? According to Ibn Abbas, he said, yes, it was. 
according to the scholars of Tafsir, they said, yes, it would. But after the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah revealed, whoever desires another deen than Islam, it will be rejected from them, not be accepted. So whoever refuses, whoever refuses to obey Allah, to submit to the teachings that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with, is doomed to the flames. So the new understanding we have has to be corrected. And Muslims are in danger. Muslims are in danger. Those who refuse to obey Allah, those who refuse to submit to what the Prophet وسلم, came with, are in danger. As long as they have the shahada intact, they shall be saved one day, as it comes in the hadith. That the fact that you have a man, it will save you one day. Even though you might be afflicted before that. So whoever wants to be afflicted by the fire, then let him disobey Allah. Whoever wants to taste the flames, then let him disobey the Prophet According to Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, يُعَذَّبْ نَاسٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ التَّوْحِيدِ فِي النَّارِ People of Tawheed, people who have La ilaha illallah will be punished in the fire. حَتَّى يَكُونُوا فِيهَا حُمُمًا Until they become charred in it, like charcoal. ثُمَّ تُدْرِكُهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ And then mercy shall overcome them. And they will be taken out. And water of paradise will be sprinkled on them and they will bloom. But these people were assigned to hell for a reason, for their disobedience. And so it is not sufficient then for a believer to say, you know, it's alright, I'm a Muslim. And everything is alright because Allah teaches us in the Quran that Muslims are like this and these people who work righteous deeds will have paradise. The Prophet wasallam says, whoever bears testimony to the fact that there is no God worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he shall enter paradise so I'm on my way to Jannah not so it might be if you're righteous if you stay away from what Allah forbids and you do what he commands you to do then perhaps Allah will have mercy on us but if you disobey then this particular hadith is a warning for those who disobey. That we have to get our act together. And the first thing that we need to get straight is our belief system. The first thing that we need to have intact in respect to obedience to Allah and obedience to the Prophet wasallam is our belief system. It has to be straight. It has to be correct. Our worship has to be correct. Allah tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have created the jinn and mankind for no other reason except to worship me. The wisdom behind our creation is ibadah. That the focus is supposed to be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we're supposed to stay away from everything that is displeasing to Allah and goes against the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala teaches us in Surah An-Nahl وَلَقَلْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُوا تَعْغُوتِ I have raised up in every time period a messenger with the command worship Allah and stay away from Tawgut and Tawgut, as Ibn Qayyim al jawzi points out, he says, is everything that a person puts up in front of him, and he exceeds his limit. A follower, a leader that he puts up in front of him, and he uses his leader to go out and transgress the limits ordained by Allah. It might be a tribe of people, it might be a methodology outside of the concept of our deen, outside of the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And he transgresses what Allah has ordained in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah. 
this person is in the wrong and he's on the wrong path and he has to be aware and we have to be careful why because in this day and time like in the past we have taken personalities as our gods a person becomes famous and his word is accepted without question he says something is halal and you say man you know it's not in the Quran this thing is uh is such but anyway you know he's such and such he says this thing is haram and you don't find it in the Quran and the Sunnah but you follow him he says no the sisters shouldn't cover themselves this is the 20th century that was for that time he says no you brothers there's no need to do such and such because it was for that time and you say, yeah, man, the brother is deep. The brother is deep. Imam, such and such is profound. And you give up your deen for the opinion of a man. According to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, this is when you make him a god. This is when you make him an object of worship. Adi, Ibn Hatim. He said, I came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa fi unuqi salib min dhahab and I had on a cross, a golden cross on my neck and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, cast this idol off take it off he said, and I heard him reciting Surah Al-Bura'a we know it's Tawbah and he was saying, they take their their scholars and their religious people as God besides Allah, laws other than Allah. He said, you know, but they don't worship them. He said, they make what is halal haram. And make what is haram halal and you follow them. He said, yes, he said, this is their worship of them. We have done this in this day and time. We have deviated in this way. A person looks into the Qur'an and he sees the verses of the Qur'an. And you know that the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions. And his companions taught his Sahaba. And his Sahaba taught the Tabi'een. And the Tabi'een taught the Atba'i Tabi'een about how to believe. And a person comes up in this day and time and he says, No, the understanding of that generation is wrong. This is how you're supposed to believe. When you go into Allah's names and attributes, His names, His attributes, His qualities, the descriptions that we find, they say, you know man, look, you see that verse over there, and the face of your Lord shall abide forever. You know what the face means? Man, is that majesty that comes into the believer's heart and that lightens up his character doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this quality or has this for himself. No. And you ask him, he says, was well, this the understanding that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left with the Sahaba? He says, uh, no, but. He said, well, was it an understanding that the Sahaba gave to the Tabi'een and passed it on? No, but. There's a sheikh over there of language. And he understands the Arabic language. He, re he memorized thousands of standards of Arabic poetry. He said, no man, this means something else. And so what you do, you put aside what the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions and they passed on to their students and their students passed on to them that silsila dhahabiyya, that golden chain, you put it aside. Because the rap sounds good. You know, it sounds good, you say, no man, the face, you know, it means majesty. And it's the majesty that flows from above into your heart and it illuminates your character. It sounds good, but it's madness. And madness and misguidance sometimes seems very pleasing to the ear. And this is why some speech has been likened to witchcraft. But we need to get beyond the rap of the individual and understand the principles of our deen. 
Otherwise, every person with a good speech and a good presentation will come and present himself and you'll be led right and left every day. But this path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left us on is straight. There is a methodology of understanding this deen. There is a methodology of worship. And following the Prophet ﷺ in this is obedience and straying is disobedience. Listen to what Awza'i used to say. Awza'i, who was one of the Atba'i Tabi'een, he used to say, Kunna wa Tabi'oon wa Tawafiroon. We used to say, that is the Atba'i Tabi'een, and the Tabi'oon, the students of the companions, were abundant. Concerning Allah's names and attributes, we used to say, accept them as they are. Without saying how. Accept it as it is. This was the same opinion that you found from Imam Malik, from Athori, Sufyan Athori, Uyayna, Makhul Shami. All of them had this same understanding that look, the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions. His companions received this understanding directly from the Prophet ﷺ. The companions taught their students. Who knows better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who knows better than his messenger? And if the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions in this way, then why should we place the understanding of people who come later above that understanding? Here is where disobedience come and people don't even realize that they're involved in disobedience. And that they come under this expression of the hadith, whoever obeys me has entered paradise. And what is amazing in the statement and the expression of the Prophet ﷺ, he uses the past tense, dakhala, to show that it is definitely going to come to pass. It is as if he is already in paradise. And whoever does not obey me has refused as if he's already in the fire. Obedience then, as it is in those acts of worship, it is to be had also in our belief system. We believe the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us to believe the way his companions taught their students to believe. So when you look at the issues of belief, and you see in this day and time these different groups coming up, and they are real alive in our day and time. They are real alive. And they have changed the face of the deen. Come to you and they open the Quran and they see all of these names, all of these qualities. That Allah will come on your Qiyam and He says, no, this ain't going to happen. Only human beings do this. Says Allah says He has a faith. No, He doesn't. Only human beings have that. And they forgot the principle. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing like Allah. But He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Consider this, brothers and sisters. Allah says He has a faith. Human beings have a faith. Listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions. One of the companions, he said that the Prophet ﷺ stood up one day and he said, he mentioned five things. He said, إن الله لا ينام ولا ينبغي له أن ينام Allah does not sleep and it's not becoming of Allah to sleep. He raises the scales and he lowers them. These done by the day go up to him before the night. Those done at night go up to him before the day. He says, وَحِجَابُهُ نُورُ And his veil is light. لَوْ كَشَفَهُ لَحْتَرَقَتْ سُبُحَاتُ وَجْهِهِ مَنْ تَهَا إِلَيْهِ بَصُرُهُ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ said if he were to remove his veil, the splendor and the illumination of his face would destroy everything as far as Allah's vision would go. Now if you know, if you know of a human being that is like Allah and has these qualities, 
Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about himself when he speaks about his ilm. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُو وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ That Allah has the keys of the unseen. No one knows it except Allah. He knows what is in the land, on the land, and what is out there, on the sea. That's everything. The word ma is what they call a general type of expression. It shows generalness. That is everything. Everything on the face of this earth. Everything from the grain of sands that we have out there. Allah knows where they are. How big they are. When they will be moved from where they are. And how far they shall be moved. He knows every grain here on each person's body. The number of them. The length of them. The discoloration that occurs when it occurs. Listen, and not only knows it, but it was written down 50,000 years before he created anything. Now if you know of someone whose knowledge is like Allah's knowledge. There is nothing whatsoever like Allah. And for this reason, the old scholars, when they looked at the Qur'an, and they looked at the Sunnah, they accepted it as it was. As the old scholars, they used to say, Amiruha kama ja'at bila kayf, accept it as it comes. Don't say how. Allah knows Himself. He describes Himself in this way, accept it. Don't let anybody come to you and say, Oh, Allah mentioned in His book a hand. You know what hand means? It means power. Doesn't mean that Allah is like mean that Allah is like that? You say, no, no, brother, was this the understanding of the tabi'een that they received from the Sahaba who were taught by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He says, no, but Shaykh such and such said. And his understanding of the language is real tight. And so you give up your deen. You give up your deen because of somebody's ability to speak, as we say, to rap the, la the Arabic language. We give up guidance for that. We have to be careful. When we go back to our belief system, this is the methodology that we use. It is this silsila, this chain that we look at. And if it is not there and someone comes up in the later time and he says, you know what, well, it seems to be like this and it seems good. And we question him, he says, brother, uh, you know, where did this understanding come from? And if his chain of narration is not correct, you know, you reject it. And this is, this is safety and security for us. Because the Prophet ﷺ pointed out, he said, he drew a line in the ground with his companions. He says, you know, this is Allah's path. He drew a straight line. And then he drew crooked lines or lines across the path. And he says, Hadi Subul. He's a different pathway. And at the top of every path, at the head of every path, there's a devil. And he may, his name might be Abdullah. Listen to me. He's a devil and his name might be Muhammad. He's a devil and he might be called Abdul Jabbar. I hope no brother's name is Abdul Jabbar. We're not finding out any brother. Huh? <laughs> hey, but the principle is there, brothers and sisters. Okay? And this is why Allah points it out. As Sabikun al Awalun min al Muhajirin wal Ansar. Waladina tabuhum bi hsan uradi Allahu anhum waradu an. Those forerunners in the deen, the Sahaba, and the Tabi'een, Allah is pleased with them. And if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us, He mentions here, and those who follow them in goodness. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us. Now one of the things, brothers, <clears throat> then, that we understand is that obedience is due in the respect to aqidah, our belief system, in areas of ibadat, worship, acts of worship. All of those things we have to consider when we speak about obedience. Okay? And this is why when Imam Ahmad used to speak about the principles of the Sunnah, he used to point out this chain of narration. And this is how we believe. This is how we get our understanding, based on this presentation. It has to go back to the Prophet ﷺ, to the companions, those who receive from the Messenger ﷺ.
that understanding and that chain is necessary for us to be on guidance. Among the other things that we need to understand, where obedience is important, or that we need to consider, is that the Prophet ﷺ sometimes did things. And he pointed out that to do the opposite of this is wrong. Alright? And sometimes the Prophet ﷺ left things off when there was every opportunity to do something, but he left it off. And all indications are that it was done deliberately. When the Prophet ﷺ leaves off something deliberately, a part of the Sunnah is to leave that thing off deliberately as well. What is Brother Free talking about? We need some examples. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of, maybe two examples. And this is probably very, very important. And one of the uh, scholars of all who deals with this in a very good way is Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya in one of his books, Kalam al Muqayyin. And for those brothers who can read the Arabic, it is very good to go through it. It has uh, a lot of good information for us and it will benefit, inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, was given the khutbah one day, Yawmul Jumu'ah. And Anas ibn Malik is narrating this. He said, The Prophet ﷺ was there in the masjid giving a khutbah. And a man entered the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ was standing and this man stood up in front of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah. Now this is Jumu'ah. Brother enters the masjid, stands up. The Prophet ﷺ is addressing the people and he said, Ya Rasulullah. Halakati al-amwal. Wanqata'ati subul Fad'u Allah yughifna. O oh, Messenger of Allah, our wealth is destroyed. The pathways have been closed. You know, no trade is coming. The rain is gone. The crops and everything have been destroyed. Supplicate to Allah. He will send rain down. He shall do this. The Prophet ﷺ turned around and he raised his hands up. Allahumma aghithna, Allahumma aghithna, Allahumma aghithna. Oh Allah, send rain down. Cause rain to come. Cause rain to come. Anas ibn Malik, he says, Wala wallahi, I swear by Allah, ma kana fi sama, min sahabin, wala qaza. There was not a cloud in the sky, not even a piece of cloud. When this man came, there was nothing in the sky. وَمَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ السَّلْعَ مِنْ بَيْتٍ وَلَا دَعْرَ And there was nothing between us and that mountain in Medina, nothing. We could see the sky. He said, and after the Prophet ﷺ made this supplication, a cloud came from over the mountain. Until it entered, it stopped in the middle of the sky, right over Medina, and then it spread out. And rain started to come down. And this Ibn Malik, he goes on and he says, he says, Wallahi, ma ra'ayna shams septen. He said, for the whole period of a week almost, we did not see any sunshine. In other words, the rain continually came down. Until the following Jumu'ah, a person came from that same door, and he stood up at the door of the message and said, Ya Rasulullah, هَلَكَتِ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْقَطَعَتِ السُّبُلِ فَادْعُوا اللَّهُ يُمْسِكَ عَنَّا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Our wealth has been destroyed. The pathways are closed. Too much barakah. The rain is coming too much. Pray to Allah to stop it. He says, فَرَفَعَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَدَيْهِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم again did what? He raised his hand. He raised his hand and he started to supplicate, Allahumma hawalayna wala alayna. 
اللهم على الاكام والضراب وبطون الاودي اودية ومنابت الشجر Oh Allah, on the hillocks and the mountains, the valleys, and the bases or the bottom of the trees. Anas ibn Malik said after the Prophet wasallam supplicated like this. In some of the narrations it says that wherever he pointed, the clouds went. Min alamat al signs of his prophethood. He says, and we left that place walking out in the sunshine. Now a person comes and he says, look, the Prophet ﷺ went when this man came in and he asked for him to pray for rain and he raised his hands up on this day. So every Jummah, when we supplicate, we are going to raise our hands up. And then now looking at the Sunnah the way it is supposed to be looked at. Was this a continual practice of the Prophet ﷺ or did he do it on this occasion alone? What he did occasionally like this for some specific reason, then we are supposed to follow him in that. We are supposed to follow him in that. Otherwise, to make that a continual practice, we are not obeying the Prophet ﷺ and we are not following his sunnah. We're not following his sunnah. And this is why Umar ibn Ru'ayba criticized Bishr ibn Marwan when he, on Yom al raised his hands up and he started to supplicate and he says, Qabbahallahu hatayn al Of course, you wouldn't, you know, you might, in this day and time, you might not want to get up in the masjid where this is done and say, Brother, may Allah disgrace your hands. You know, we have some people from the hood I know some of the brothers understand what that means. If you get up in a masjid like that, unless you're a real good fighter, or you got a good pair of legs, you might get hurt. You need to use some wisdom. Okay? We need to use some wisdom when dealing with issues. You don't just get up and try to criticize everybody, man, that is doing wrong right like that out in the open. The man is giving the khutbah. Everybody listen to him. He might not know that this is not to be done. And there might be a difference of opinion according to the scholars, whatever there is. But you want to discuss it to him or with him in a way where he is receptive. You want to have him listen to you. Perhaps you might be right. Perhaps you might be wrong. But what you know of the sunnah, this is what you know. This was the practice. This was not the practice. So you want to deal with him as a brother who might have committed a wrong. But you don't want to try to disgrace him. You don't want to make him feel bad. That's not your intent. You want to have him come over to the practice of the sunnah so you want to do it in a way that is acceptable to him. Something that is pleasing. Don't you see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed Musa and Harun to go to Fir'aun, who claimed Uluhiyah for himself, that he was Allah, said, speak to him in a gentle way. Why? Because human nature is that. When you, when you show kindness, most of the time, people are receptive. They would at least listen to you. But if you go up in the front of a person and you start screaming and shouting in his face, you're in trouble. First of all, they don't want to hear you. Okay? So one of the things <coughs> is that when the Prophet ﷺ left off something and there was every opportunity for this thing to be done and he left it off in what is indicated that it was left off deliberately, we leave it off deliberately. Okay? For example, another example of that is the hadith that we have. And this is from Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna al-Mu'min the believer, when he meets another believer, and he greets him, Assalamu alaikum, and he takes his hand and he shakes it, before they turn away, their sins fall down, just like leaves fall off a tree. You know, the dry leaves, just like that. Anas ibn Malik was questioned, Akanatin musaf hatu. He has had the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Did the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they ever shake hands? 
said, yes. A person comes now and he says, man, look, you know, you heard about the barakah and the blessings of shaking hands? Look, after every salat, let us turn to the brother on the side and say, Asalaamu Alaikum, Taqabbal Allahu Minka. And it becomes a practice. You say, well, you know, the Prophet Wasallam said in the hadith that if you meet your brother and you shake his hands, that your sins fall down. So we want to do this after every salat. Every brother turns to the other brother, no matter if you just met him, and you say, Asalaamu Alaikum, and you might add, like we said, Taqabbal Allah. The question here is, was this done during the time of the Prophet ﷺ in respect to this act of ibadah? No, nah, brother, but it feels good. Was it something that the companions did after them? No, nah, brother, but the barakah. Look, be sure, I have no doubt that there is no barakah in misguidance. There is no blessing in innovation, even though it might feel good. You know, people who sit in a group, and they do some things, and they say, man, it feels good. Our deen is not based on what we feel. It's based on the authentic teachings that we find in the, in the Sunnah and the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us. And what was left off by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when there was every opportunity in that act of worship, then we should not make it a part of that act of worship. And this is obedience to the Prophet ﷺ. This is an aspect of obedience. And we see this all over. We see it all over. All you have to do is travel to the different masjids. The Prophet ﷺ taught us about Surah Al-Fatiha and the blessings of it. A person says, look man, after the Salah, let everybody raise their hands. You. Because if it was done, it would have been conveyed to us. It would have been found somewhere in the book that it was done. But the fact that we have no evidence shows that it was not acted upon. And so, the things that the Prophet wasallam left aside, we're supposed to leave aside. That he li deliberately left aside, we're supposed to leave aside. That is an aspect of obedience. That is an aspect of obedience. Finally, <clears throat> One of the things that we need to know is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he makes something specific and he says this is for that occasion and that occasion alone, then we're not to say it is to be done at all times. You're not being obedient when this is done. Okay? You're not being obedient when that is done. For example, look, there is a discussion about music and musical instruments and whether or not it's lawful or not but we're going to take the position because of the ahadith that we have that the musical instruments they're not lawful you're not supposed to be a Muslim mu musician okay playing your your saxophone or your trumpet and your drum and saying that you're giving Islamic da'wah the Prophet ﷺ prophesied that there will become a time, there shall come a time when some of the people from this nation will seek to make lawful those things. Alright? Yastahilluna al ma'aziz, Along with some other things, these musical instruments. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ points out that something is generally haram, and you find an exception, for example, the hadith that we find in Bukhari and Muslim and others where the Prophet ﷺ was in his room and the two young girls were beating the duf. And the duf is like a tambourine without the little jingles around it. Alright? Hollow on one side like that. And the person says that the Prophet ﷺ said it's alright to do it. And especially if you have a bad translation of Bukhari, it says, musical instruments. It says it in the hadith in Bukhari that musical instruments on Eid is all right. And so you find that the, 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 the sisters be up on stage singing, and the brothers be just like the days before Islam. 
and everybody's swaying trying to control themselves to be a little bit Islamic. All right? But the problem is that, the problem with that is a lack of understanding of how the two narratives relate. In the narrative, the first narrative where the Prophet ﷺ basically indicated that musical instruments, that those things are not lawful, that's a general statement. Here in this particular narration where Abi Bax came in and he says Abi Mizmar fi bayti Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Mizmar is shaytan fi bayti Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the flutes of the devil in the Prophet's house sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something that is very important he said da'huma ya Abi Bax فَإِنَّهَا أَيَّامَ عِيدٍ This here, this statement, فَإِنَّهَا The ulama, when they look at this statement, it shows the reason why you are to leave them alone. In other words, he says, leave them alone because on this day, this special time, you are allowed to do that in this way. That is an exception to the law and it's not the rule. To make it a rule is to go against the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and to be involved in disobedience. He, the Prophet ﷺ says, فَإِنَّهَا This is what they call أَسَالِيبِ الْعِلَّةِ Yani it shows the reason why the law is there. Because of such and such, leave it alone. In other words, if this was not the case, it would be unlawful for the brothers and the sisters to be involved in this. And of course, they were little girls. And it was the sisters who used to beat the doof, not the brothers. Okay? And you would be considered something else in that day and time, a, a brother walking around, swinging and swaying, beating the doof. Alright, so that is something else. But the understanding, the principle here, brothers and sisters, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out something specific or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points out that something is to be done on occasions we don't make it general because that is an act of disobedience and you come under the warning of this hadith all of my nation shall enter paradise except the one who refuses It comes under that. You are disobedient here when you do not follow the sunnah the way the Prophet ﷺ taught it to his companions. So when he makes something specific, we leave it as specific. We don't try to generalize it. Okay, and this can be found in other areas of fit, but that example, because of our time, we'll have to do. Alright? Now, so, what do we have? Obedience, then, is a little bit more extensive than just saying, okay, uh, we hear that the Prophet ﷺ said that such and such is to be done, such and such is to be done. But we need to understand the dynamics of the hadith. We need to go to the explanations of the narrative or to seek help with someone who knows so that we get some type of understanding of what is meant, what is intended behind the sexual evidence that we have. Because people have been picking up, you know, alhamdulillah for what we have in translations. We are now getting some very good translations. Alright? But previously, we have had a lot of mistakes being done because the brothers and sisters were reading the book and the tra- there was a mistranslation. Like that particular translation of the book meaning musical instruments. Of course if you read that, it means that you could get your guitar you could get your sash, you could get your bongos, your congos, and you could throw down on E. Okay? But that is not the case. That is not the case. The Prophet ﷺ meant, كُلُّ أُمَّةِ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى All of my nation shall enter paradise, except the one who refuses. The one who refuses to follow him. The one who refuses to obey him in respect to his practices in respect to his belief system, in respect to the understanding that he left with his Sahaba. All of those areas are areas where a person can refuse. 
And we have to be careful not to fall into that category. We need to be careful not to fall into that category. I think my time is up and my voice is almost gone. And, uh, but that's it. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah.